That Naturopathic Podcast. TNP. Hello there. Hi, and thanks for joining us. I'm Dr. Cara Denisio. And I'm Dr. David Miller, and we hear your frustrations. This show is for you. This show is for you if you're feeling like your current healthcare strategy is not getting to the root cause or the underlying reasons for your health. This show is for you if you've been told that you're fine, but you definitely don't feel very well. This show is for you if you're walking out of your doctor's office with one, two, three, four, or even five medications without any mention of diet, lifestyle, or a long-term game plan. This show is for you if you've got several specialists taking care of you, but no one is really putting it all together. This show is for you if you believe that health should be part of health care. These problems have solutions. We know it. Our patients know it. And we want you to know it. Naturopathic medicine is the solution that you need to know about. All right, you know we talk a lot about iron on this podcast. It comes up with almost every guest. Which makes sense. It's the world's most common nutrient deficiency after all. So we were really excited when Farah Pro reached out to sponsor TNP in recognition of us championing the importance of iron deficiency. Well, let's get right to the point. Iron deficiency is often inappropriately assessed or diagnosed and is very often inadequately treated. Which means it will leave you or your patients feeling tired and literally pulling their hair out if it doesn't fall out first. And often the dose just isn't enough. We have typically only had a lower dose 30 milligram iron supplement available for our dispensaries. So we've been having to send patients to the pharmacy for higher dose products that may be hard on the gut or have a lot of binders, artificial colors, and fillers. But thankfully, Ferropro has been solving this problem for over 20 years with their lineup of intelligent and clean pharmacist-formulated iron products. I love that the Ferropro lineup includes a 30 milligram, 75 milligram, and their high dose 150 milligram iron per cap so that you can have the right dose right there when your patient needs it. If you think your patients would benefit from Ferapro, send an email to info at ferapro.com. Thanks for listening, and now on to the show. Okay, welcome everyone to another episode of That Naturopathic Podcast. This is Dr. Dave. And this is Dr. Kara. And who do we have today? This is Dr. Jessica <laughs> Liu. And I'm Nora Pope. I retired from naturopathic medicine last year in 2019. Congratulations. So we're so excited to have, uh, yeah, congratulations. We're so excited to have uh, Dr. Jessica and Dr. Nora here with us. Um, They are a dynamic, amazing duo bringing so much clinical experience and knowledge and education in the fertility space. Uh, They're coming out with this fantastic fertility CE course for naturopathic doctors uh, coming up here in January, which I am enrolled in. I'm really excited to uh, learn from you too. But today we're going to learn from both of you and um, our our listeners and our patients and any naturopaths listening uh, can hear our conversation. Today, we're going to talk about cycle charting and uh, fertility and progesterone and um, all of that kind of good stuff. So why don't you just tell us a little bit more about what you're up to and why you're so passionate about this topic? Okay, well, I began naturopathic school in 1998. And I think at the time, I'm pretty sure I was the only woman in the class who knew when she was fertile and when she was not fertile because I had been doing cycle charting since 1994. And I was saddened, but not surprised, that most women didn't know about their cycle, and meaning their days of fertility and days of infertility. And then I took a breast cancer course with Dr. Satdarm Carr, and she was talking about progesterone uh, as being protective against breast cancer. And I, and I said to her, I said, well, if you cycle chart, you introduce progesterone on certain days of the month after you ovulate. And I knew this because of cycle charting. So for me, it it wasn't just about birth control or postponing or achieving pregnancy. It was really about health because progesterone is so important for the brain all the way down to your toes. It's just, it's a very important hormone. So I've been on a mission since 1998 to teach body literacy, which is a term coined by Laura Werschler. She used to work at Planned Parenthood. Um, But I really believe in body literacy, fertility literacy, and progesterone literacy. And ultimately, after I teach this course, I want to build a community where everyone knows about progesterone. Um, In the ER, it can save lives. In your clinic office, it can save a baby. 
in your life, it can save your mental health and prevent brain cancer and prevent breast cancer. It's a very important hormone. It's poorly understood. And I'm on a mission to have every naturopathic doctor know about the power of progesterone. That's and you got, a, you got a partner on a mission. That's where you go. You know what? And, and my journey with fertility has been 15 years now in clinic. And, you know, this is, it's an epidemic. You know, the, the average woman who comes into my office dealing with fertility challenges or subfertility, she's not in her 40s. She's in her early to mid 30s. You know, ovarian reserve is on the decline. Ovarian quality stress levels are on the rise. You know, I did a lecture a couple of years ago on the impact of stress on fertility. And there is, there are so many associations between recurrent fertility stress and loss and PTSD. And, and it's a silent thing, right? It's a cyclical thing. And, and this is something where I think naturopathic doctors shine because we are experts in healthy physiology. And I always tell my patients, a menstrual cycle for a woman is like a fifth vital sign. You know, if you have a healthy menstrual cycle, healthy, beautiful red bleeding, and you're not afraid to examine your cervical fluids, you know, this is how a woman can empower herself to be the Beautiful. She can be right. So that's, well, where, that's where I'm coming from. Well said, Dr. Jessica. <laughs> hmm. well, I love it. Guys... I love your passion on this. And um, I think, yeah. yeah, go ahead, Dave. Well, I was just going to say, how did you guys come to work together? Because it sounds like you come from, you know, different life experiences and, and all that. And, and now, you know, Nora had a lot of experience as a naturopathic doctor for, you know, she's, she would, can we call you an elder? I mean, it's kind of a, it's a nice thing, I think. Um, and so how, how do you, now you get to work with an elder, Jessica, how does, what's I the do, sort of yeah, dynamic she, duel that color happens there? Savant. She's, she's so brilliant. <laughs> this woman is just like a walking encyclopedia, but you know, we actually, she reminded me, we met at a doula course. That's right. We how met many years ago we, now. We met at 2005. So by then I'd been in practice for about three years and Jessica was in fourth year. Yeah. And I sat beside her and I thought, she has a really special energy. She was kind, she was bright, she was intelligent, and she was positive. Because I'll be honest with you, in that doula course, I got um, a little, I hate the word, but I got triggered um, when they were talking, they did a beautiful film on C-sections. And after the film, you actually loved C-sections, and you loved the surgeon, because the surgeon had this amazing bedside manner. But once again, the poor mother didn't have the chance to have a natural birth. Did she really need that C-section? And then, um, you know, also doula work is very, very personal. And I found sometimes the tone was not so sensitive, shall we say. So I'm very picky. I know what I like in a teacher. I know what I like in a course. And there was Jessica, kind, <laughs> intelligent, bright, and very intuitive. And we could finish each other's sentences. So I thought, I like this person. And then I kept, we kept bumping into each other. <laughs> Um, at a wonderful breast cancer seminar given by um, that wonderful doctor from Brown University. I forget her name, but blah, blah, blah. Schuler. Really brilliant woman. And then, and then I was involved with Lisa Duran's group, the Association of Perinatal Naturopathic Doctors. And we produced some conferences at Women's College Hospital. And Jessica Lou was there and she got up, she sprung from her seat and she gave me a hug. And I thought, <laughs> not only do I like her, but she's bright. And so, mm -hmm. so and then I started giving cycle charting courses Dr. Lou signed up in February 17, and the rest is history. And I, ha I have to say, Dr. Nora's progesterone and cycle charting course has completely changed the way I practice fertility medicine. And it's, it's just made it such a joy to do. And this is why we put this course together. And, you know, eventually we'd like to perhaps give some courses to the public to help empower every woman to understand their body more. You know, this is, this is the thing, like you can know your health and your fertility just from a mere observation of something that happens every month in your body. And it doesn't necessarily require blood tests or expensive evaluation. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, and this is about restoring something that is innately there for many women and just needs to be kind of teased out. Right. So we're really passionate about what talk, we're doing. Okay, sure. talk, about the, talk about the time about that baby born at 23 weeks. Talk about that. Talk about that. I'm very excited. See. I have a case. I don't know if it's a good time to share, yeah. but just to share, you know, the power of knowing, you know, what is an optimal level of something in the body is different than what is bare minimum for survival. Right. And again, naturopathic mm -hmm. doctors, we work in the realm of optimal. 
we're not just happy with just okay, right? I know, Dr. Kara, you're so passionate about iron levels in women and what is an optimal level of ferritin? Well, there is an actual optimal level of progesterone during the luteal phase mm-hmm. or the post-ovulation time in a woman's cycle and in early pregnancy. And I had a patient who she was on progesterone. She had a deficiency leading into her, you know, becoming pregnant. And we just kept her on because as we are testing in her first trimester, she was still sort of suboptimal. And I kept her on progesterone uh, to 16 weeks and we decided to to stop there and slowly wean off and we're going to retest again. Um, And she, she was off for a couple of weeks. I didn't, I wasn't in touch with her. And then the next thing I know, she delivered her baby at 22 weeks. Wow. At 22 weeks is a very low survival rate for a fetus, right? Lungs aren't developed, but this baby was so physiologically well-developed. And when they looked at her case, there was nothing wrong with her cervix, nothing wrong with the baby. She just delivered at 22 weeks. And they said that it was probably the progesterone. This baby survived and he's doing great. But I'm going to jump in here. So now I'm going to edit her course. So this is me going crazy that obstetricians don't know about <laughs> they know about last menstrual period and this hunch is that this woman conceived way earlier in her cycle i would say it could be as early as cycle day eight or nine Mm -hmm. which most fertility clinics and obstetricians don't consider they say everyone conceives around day 14 but we're going to start from the last menstrual period so that baby could have been a week older Mm -hmm. and another reason and so we teach this in the course of how to time a pregnancy from conception because the last menstrual period is a really inaccurate biomarker for timing a pregnancy. And this is the power of cycle charting, that it can help you with obstetricians and, and uh, you know, and maternal-based care and better outcomes. But also, I have no children. I've never been pregnant. But I'm so glad I cycle charted because I know exactly what my body is doing. So we, we really feel the information is so important. So, Agreed. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I have a similar case of just, it's sometimes fertility. It's just timing, right? I have a patient who, you know, uh, just didn't understand her cycle, but thought, you know, she had infertility. She wasn't getting pregnant, wasn't getting pregnant. And it literally just took an hour conversation in my office to say, Hey, here's your cycle. Like, let's look at it. Here's what you need to look at here. Let's put some dates in. Let's let's talk about this. Let's learn what the different like cervical mucus looks like. You know, we might do, you know, we did a little bit of hormone testing. She's like, Oh, I've been, I I ovulate really early. And like the next month, (laughs) Oh, there we are. We're pregnant. And so it's not, they, you know, to people who understand cycles, it seems like magic, like this, (laughs) uh, (laughs) this magic thing, but really it's just that for so long, we don't understand, you know, 400 times in our life, we're going to have a cycle. So we might as well understand what's happening. And I think it's empowering for, for women just starting in their reproductive lives, right? Like it's such a stigma, even still for teens to talk about their fluids and to, to be able to assess. And I think it's important for girls to know about their bodies, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's really empowering information. So we have a bit of a little bit of an uh, information campaign on our social media sites. And we talk about some of the biomarkers, red flow being your period and white flow being your ovulation fluids or your cervical fluids or your estrogen driven fluids. And we want to get that wording out there because let's face it, seminal fluid, ick, seminal fluid, I mean, cervical fluid, eek, cervical mucus, eek, eek. If there's an ick factor and it's very hard to talk about it and make it media friendly. So we figured out that red flow and white flow can be something that you can just talk about because red flow and white flow. Yeah. We're talking about women, but white flow, we're also talking about men. And in that way, when you talk about human reproduction, it's the power of the fluids of both Mm -hmm. men and women, because it's really, you're talking about um, with men, it's not just one sperm with women. It's not just one ova, you know, one ovary, one egg. You're talking about conception happening in fluid, bathed in fluid, that's full of nutrients, full of zinc, full of potassium, full of sugars, full of fructose. It's alkaline. It's very mobile. And a woman's white flow and a men's white flow are complementary. And we're all of us are conceived in our mother's fallopian tube. That's where, you know, or the salpingi tube, the salpingis. And um, 
And that needs to be discussed. And one of the goals of the course is really understand what white flow does. And that's how you can identify when you're, you know, when you're ovulating or about to ovulate. So what's a big mission for the course. Mm -hmm. So check out our social media. (laughs) Could you maybe walk us? um, I just wanted to note, like, I know there's so much skill and thought that can go into teaching cycle charting. um, And you probably, it's probably beyond what we can do in this podcast, but is there a nuts and bolts version that you could walk our listeners through just kind of some key things to watch out for in their cycles? So now we're going to, we're going to jump in and we're going to dance. So I'll talk and then you talk and I talk and you talk. Okay. We're doing the Watusi. All right. So we'll start with the first day of the flow. <laughs> we'll call that cycle day one. And what do you do when you get your period? You're wiping, 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 and you're getting into the habit of making wiping observations. So when you start charting roughly the first five days of your, of the cycle is bleeding. And that's when you're going to put wet stick, red stickers on your chart. Okay. Then what happens? But I'm bummed. You're going to have some, some dry days, right? This is where you're, you know, physiologically what's happening in the back end is that your estrogen starting to now build FSH, which is a hormone from your pituitary gland in the brain that tells the ovaries, okay, now the period's done time to make some new eggs or allow them to start growing and maturing at the same time your lining is static rise in estrogen yet so after your period is done normally there's some dry days right and then so you put a so you're wiping and this is important and this is what i say in the course infertility is your friend those dry days are days of infertility and so they have a green sticker on the chart and basically like dr lou said your, your hormones are beginning to rise but there's not enough hormone levels in the blood to change the physiology of the ovary just yet then there's a rise in estrogen. Dr. Lee, what happens after that? And then your rise in estrogen is really what promotes this beautiful, mucus rich, fluid rich um, cervical changes. So these are the crypts that line the whole length of the cervix to start releasing this beautiful fluid. White flow. The white flow (laughs) that is sperm friendly (laughs) and alkaline. So it's feeding the sperm, it's nourishing the sperm. And it actually creates these little highways, these mini highways to give a a clear path for the sperm to, you know, traverse gravity and get in there. To travel up the vagina, up the cervix, up the uterus, up to the fallopian tube where it meets the... Woohoo! The egg that's about to be hatched. One okay. thing that I learned when I did Nora's course a few years ago, that which I loved, is that you don't you don't need to actually see your fluid to know where you're at in your cycle. You could be blind mm-hmm. and just go by touch, wiping, go by wiping, feel, wiping, and by wiping, wiping right? Wiping. Yeah, yeah. So, so so it's a daily observation, right? right? I always tell my patients, it's, it's you know those days when you wipe with your toilet paper and it. And it slips up and hits you in the face. <laughs> That's <laughs> a good white flow day. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that, basically the slipperiness, because the vagina is normally acidic. And like, you know, it's part of our immune system. It's protective. We protect, we protect it from the external environment with an acidic vagina. And, and, and you know, um, and that can, it, it protects the body. But for that window, our fertility window, the alkaline cervical fluid um, is very slippery. It's like, imagine putting a bit of bleach in water. And then you're, you're washing some white clothes. Your hands will feel slippery because bleach is very alkaline. So similar feeling in that. Good analogy. And then, okay, so, but back to the blind person. By making these wiping observations, that's why I keep saying infertility is your friend. Because those dry days, those days of infertility will help you, give you a clear experiential difference. It's a clear demarcation point between fertile and not fertile. So on the days of white flow, you put white stickers and because it's color coordinated (laughs) and then boom the next day you're going to have a dry day so then the day before was your peak estrogen day and that's and then your peak estrogen day is sort of the last day of peak production of estrogen it's not ovulation and then you add three more days because though you can conceive in those three days and i'll go into more detail in the course and then the rest of the time it's why is it dry then your progesterone takes over right so so keep in mind that the the mucus that we're experiencing is correlated to your estrogen levels. So as soon as estrogen peaks, it actually has to drop in order for another hormone from 
the pituitary gland, you know, or from the, the eggs called luteinizing hormone is produced to help that egg erupt from the follicle, right? That is sort of where you get this post peak day of dry, right? And that's how you know, okay, ovulation is about to happen. And this is where I think even some doctors get confused sometimes. I know I did, is that you would, you know, you know, you would associate the mucus obviously with your, as a fertile window, but that, that fertile window actually goes beyond those mucus days because your cervix is still open for business, so to speak, <laughs> for three more days after that last day of beautiful, stretchy, slippery mucus. So getting all these details in, we're not even talking about temperature charting, you know, that's a whole other topic. Just knowing the days of really good flow, the days of dry days, the days where your mucus turns into what I like to call, you know, uncooked pancake batter, you know, that sticky, tacky, pasty stuff that happens after ovulation. This is driven by progesterone and it's really brilliant because it produces this beautiful mucus plug, so to speak, yeah. at the end of your cervix to block other dude's sperm from getting in there, <laughs> right? So, you know, the evolution has created this beautiful system to support fertility um, in its natural form, right? Oh, wow. well done. <laughs> She's my best student. <laughs> That was a good, it, it's not, uh, it, well, you know what, we, Dave and I always say, when you're an expert in something, you can make it, uh, you can actually boil it down into simplicity. So um, that's coming across nice and clear. So let's talk about this then. So if that progesterone, if, if it is a good segue into talking yeah. about progesterone, um, what, where does this go wrong? So like, you know, you talked about how fertility, you know, is really becoming a major issue. We're seeing more women with infertility. Um, what, what's going to throw this off? Like what's going to throw off that uh, white flow? What's going to throw off progesterone uh, production? Mm -hmm. Well, both white flow in women and white flow in men have changed in the last 50 years. So I'll talk quickly about men because of all the governments in the world, I think the Danish government has done an amazing job at analyzing um, seminal fluid. And uh, just to make a long story short, they've observed a 50 to 60% decline in the number of sperm in men's seminal fluid in Denmark alone. So the Danish government has done an amazing job at, at monitoring the decline in fertility. So there's that aspect. Why is that happening in men? So you could say there's industrial pollutants that are xenoexogens, that, that could be one cause. Um, one cause I've been monitoring is the metabolites of the oral contraceptive pill. The pill has been around since 1960, 61. And as women imbibe the pill and urinate out the metabolites, these chemical hormone-like structures um, are in the water supply and we're all exposed to that. So men can have declining sperm counts and women can have declining ovulation rates because the body can be confused or certain receptors are bound. And maybe certain estrogen receptors in the cervix are bound and not producing enough cervical fluid or white flow. That's one reason. The other one is, um, you know, stress can steal certain hormones, can suck up certain hormones because to modulate stress, uh, you have to shunt certain anti-inflammatory or anti-stress hormones in a different direction, which steals the raw materials to produce estrogen and progesterone. So that's a very brief summary. Dr. Liu. <laughs> yeah, I, th I have a lot to say about stress, even from a Chinese medicine perspective, right? So we talk about, you know, our, our adrenals being the glands that sit on top of the kidneys and they're tiny little things, but they really help us figure out how do we navigate the world? How do we, what's safe and not safe, right? And the problem is, is that genetically, from an evolutionary standpoint, we're supposed to just have lulls where we're just chilling around doing nothing. And then we have like maybe one saber tooth tiger to deal with once a month and, and that's it. It's acute short lived stress. Now though, we're getting environmental stress, social stress, just lack of sleep, like food quality, all these different stresses that are creating this prolonged chronic level of high stress, or high cortisol levels. And in Chinese medicine, that's very depleting because what we need to nourish our ovaries and to nourish 
that energy to create these these gametes, these eggs or sperm is we need that energy, right? And so just from a, that philosophical standpoint, we're not our bodies are not accustomed to this low grade level of fight or flight or stress on a daily basis. And so, you know, this is why we're seeing women who you know, physiologically, everything's fine on blood work. They are fine. And yet there's this nebulous diagnosis of this unknown, you know, unexplained for infertility. That is probably the most common thing that I do see in my practice because, you know, it's, you know, we, these are the patients that we get. Mm-hmm. Right. And I'm going to jump in here. Sorry. What drives me crazy is that if you look at blood test results, the, the conventional approach is that, oh, okay, if your estrogen is anywhere from three to 3,003, that's healthy. And if your progesterone is anywhere from four to 404, that's healthy. Well, that's, that's bullocks, you know, mm-hmm. you need a tighter range, mm-hmm. an optimal range to ensure a healthy ovulation. And you need a tighter range to ensure that the corpus luteum is building up those progesterone reserves to for a successful implantation so i te- we teach in the course optimal ranges for optimal health and we don't go all vague and we don't say yeah that three three thousand number range is just healthy that's it's meaningless so but i'm, I'm going to mm-hmm. pipe in here i have i think another reason why fertility is declining is it's i'm going to call it bad karma um you know i came from a very large family of seven children and all my life complete strangers come up to me at parties or art galleries or wherever my mom would take me and she says and strangers would tell me seven children oh you poor mother <laughs> and I've heard this my entire life and when I was a little girl a, a, book, a book that had a lot of influence on public policy was called the population bomb and the end of the world was coming and you know children pollute the world and too many children is bad and evil well psychologically we absorb that we absorb that and maybe our bodies are saying, well, gee, are, do we want children or don't we? Right now in, the, in Trump, Canada's newspapers, we need more immigration because we don't have enough Canadians. And also our public service is bloated and we have <laughs> pensions are too expensive and they're getting worried that they have no one to pay for their pensions. And big problem. We have huge societal challenges. So, yeah, you know, and also... What do you mean? What about diversity of thought? What, so what if you're 22 and you have a baby? What's wrong with that? Uh, oh my God, you're not ready. You need a career. You need a roof over your head. You need this. You need three cars before you start a family. Says who? Why don't you start a family at 22, 23? We're all healthy and have a lot of energy at 22, 23. So we have societal challenges of why fertility is on the decline. And I think we have cultural challenges. So mm-hmm. but in our course, we really want to hone in on good medical naturopathic information so our students have the tools to hit the ground running but definitely there are all kinds of reasons why fertility is on the decline mm-hmm. sorry I, I know I just I'm sorry I'm ranting but That's I can't okay. I can't help it I can't help it so <laughs> I love it Nora you being retired or I guess you're not retired but you're no, no longer practicing um affords you <laughs> to say things that we perhaps, uh, you know, can't say. We had a, a chat a chat before recording about our current state of our profession, and it's nice to be able to let loose, I'm sure. Um, I just want to clarify something you said, because I'm just curious. I know you had said, I, I've seen charts of actually what normal sperm parameters look like. Um, I believe they're from the World Health Organization, and I can't remember the time frame, but the standards the bar was definitely lowered more recently and what we're looking at with respect to what healthy sperm quality and quantity looks like. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm just curious, um, ha- have you seen changes? Is, has the progesterone bar come down too? The, uh, uh, well, yeah, the, the, the reference range is No, the, 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 the progesterone range has always been too vast and too vague. Um, so that's why women are labeled with idiopathic infertility. They just don't know why they don't know why. Um, and so, um, but yes, I would say, you know, I've been cycle charting since 1994. Yes. You could say that um, back then in the nineties, I would say progesterone has gone down as a, as a general rule. I would agree with that. And you can um, save and maintain a pregnancy, even if you started out with lower progesterone levels. So I would, I would say we do have the skills and the technology now to save a pregnancy 
So even though you're aiming for those optimal numbers, you can accommodate those lower numbers. Like there's, there's, a, there's still tons of hope and positive outcomes just by supporting the woman um, as early as you can when you get those blood tests back for, for her HCG and her progesterone. So, so yes, but I have seen a shift in my little universe of fertility. Absolutely. So. And Nora and Jessica, I just have a question about those those ranges. Like I, I remember um, my first few years few years of practice, seeing them and going the same. Like there's orders of magnitude difference. Like, and then I'm looking mm-hmm. at my, you know, I'm thinking, okay, well they change from really low numbers to really high, and then they dip again. So why isn't the day specified or the the part of the the yeah. period specified? Can you talk a little bit maybe about that and how the range? You know, yeah, reflects that or that's not. a really good question because oftentimes we'll get patients who, you know, as, as best we can, we want to work with their medical professionals to get the blood tests done. And, and we have to be very specific as to the timing of those tests, right? Our progesterone, yes, we want, you know, a, a cycle day three progesterone as a baseline, but that's where they leave it often. And they're not looking at post peak or post ovulatory lo- mid luteal phase progesterone levels that's the whole point. Like this is where implantation ha- is happening. So don't we want to know what the optimal levels of progesterone should be in that range? And, you know, for fertility clinics, because it with IVF, you know, it's common practice to prescribe either injectable or, you know, intravaginal um, suppositories for progesterone to support implantation. <laughs> But is the woman able to do it well on her own? Because that also lends to the idea that what is her body doing with all that progesterone, right? Is she sucking it up to deal with inflammation because she's got low grade endometriosis or she's got post concussion syndrome or, you know, psoriasis, you know, flaring up in the background, like what is her body doing with that progesterone? Sure, you could supplement with it, but it says something to the quality of her own hormonal terrain, right? If you're not testing in the luteal phase, if you're not testing with their first or second HCG test when they get pregnant, how are you to know whether it's enough? How are you to know that that level is adequate, right? Mm -hmm. I'm so glad you said that. The number one question I would hear from patients is why is my progesterone low? And this is where naturopathic doctors excel. I mean, we do a big review of systems as on the first appointment. We want to know everything that's happening to our patients from head to toe. Well, skin conditions like eczema and psoriasis are inflammatory. By calming down the eczema and psoriasis, women get pregnant much more easily. So we become mini dermatologists, and then we can help with the obstetrics and gynecology. But I think patients get very excited about that because they, they just say everyone's whenever I, my psoriasis or my eczema gets ignored. It's don't ignore it. It's relevant. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, there are all kinds of inflammatory conditions help that reduce the inflammation. Pregnancy will occur much more easily. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So. And again, as Nora alluded to at the beginning, there are restorative benefits of having hormones in their optimal range, right? Progesterone, you know, Nora Mm -hmm. is actually an an epilepsy expert as well. So there is really good research to show that progesterone actually helps with a whole host of other things, whether it's Alzheimer's prevention or optimal thyroid function or reducing pain. I have a patient who went into early menopause and that is when her multiple sclerosis kicked into high gear. When we optimize progesterone, her MS quieted down, her brain scan stabilized. So, you know, there's just so much more to learn about healthy levels and optimal, optimizing hormone levels is a huge part of what we do. Um, and we're hoping to shed more light on that. Hmm. Now I see a question from our audience. Too. What about progesterone in males? This is actually, you know, we, at our school, Alvin Petal was a guest lecturer and he, he, I think, was prescribing progesterone in some of his male patients to um, mitigate some of the effects of prostate cancer. And so forgive me, I just don't have enough experience in that area, but definitely you, I think, you know, that's a really good question. Um, and so I don't have so, enough experience. In you it, know, but- progesterone is a natural part of our steroid hormone mm-hmm. metabolism pathway, right? So it, it is pregnenolone, progesterone. These are the precursors for things like DHEA, and cortisol, these are all essential hormones that men need. 
um, and, and sort of this backdoor pathway to get to other sources of testosterone in men. But to prescribe progesterone in men, that's not something I believe needs to happen because their levels are so much lower than women. Progesterone is really um, so different physiologically in a woman's body for obvious reasons, right? So that's mm -hmm. sort of where it's not my area mm -hmm. of expertise. Yeah, but yeah I was I just wondering what sort of, um, why women um, like need, what is physiological difference or, or, or subtleties or nuances that makes it that progesterone um, is more important for optimal function, whereas men seem to be, uh, I mean, I don't, I'm not an expert in this. So I'll, let me full disclosure. I'm not an expert in this. I just, well, it is called, I was just going to say it is called progesterone pro gestation. So, yeah, but there was all these neurological thinking of effects. carrying a baby anytime soon. No, there's all these neurological mm -hmm. effects and we all have brains. Um, mm -hmm, uh, sure. arguably, uh, we all have brains. Uh, so, um, <laughs> You know, that, that's what was making me think, because I've seen this as a, as a treatment for neurological uh, post-concussion and, and things like that. And it is something yeah. that when I see someone with uh, post-concussion syndrome or whatever, I, and it's a, it's a female patient, I think about progesterone um, as I look at the whole patient. But I'm just thinking, what about men? I wonder, I just, mm -hmm. I just you know, I'm sorry to, to sort of throw that at you. Dave? It's a great question. Mm -hmm. I think it, I think it warrants. Can you throw it at me? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so I know I, I'm intrigued. I would say that it's the same argument. I was just going to say it, it's this, probably the same argument or it's probably the same equivalent as testosterone, right? It's, it's not that we don't need it. It's essential in men and women. Yes. Uh, it's just a matter of the level. So testosterone mm -hmm. is way higher in men. but that doesn't levels. Mm -hmm. And I'd say progesterone would be an equivalent example for men. Yeah. No, I think, I think I would love to see some research on low dose progesterone for men. I think that would be wonderful. And yeah, I think that's great. Um, it, one of the drugs we talk about in our course is HCG. Um, HCG is, equ is equated with, you know, the, the, the sort of, it rises in pregnancy in women, but you can prescribe HCG for both men and women to help with the, the cycle of SSH and LH. So with women that would include ovulation and men and men that would include spermatogenesis. Mm -hmm. So there are, um, a, there is a lateral move you can do in both men and women to help raise their estrogen and progesterone. And that's what, that's with HCG. It's a really interesting drug that we talk about in the course. So. Mm -hmm. Good question. So, We've, we've kind of gone, gone through the cycle, gone through, like, obviously a very quick snapshot of what, uh, you know, what, what a cycle would look like from your period through to ovulation and then back around to your period again. It's interesting. I, I think about this sometimes. It's, you know, in naturopathic medicine, we talk about, you know, factors that lead to health and the cycle is like literally a 30 day window, right? Like what you're doing in the first half of the cycle we see, we can literally see in signs and symptoms and, and fluids and hormone levels in the second half. So it's a beautiful example of how we almost look at health when you travel through that cycle. Yeah. And I think more and more what I'm trying to, you know, share, shed light on with, even for patients who are not interested in fertility, but interested in optimizing their own bodies. You know, I think many women can safely say that there is a clear difference in their mood, in their motivation, in the way their body retains fluids, you know, when you compare before ovulation and after ovulation, right? And so I teach women to really honor their bodies in those different phases, you know, made for me pre-ovulation, this is when I'm booking meetings, this is when I'm taking on my new projects, I love my children. No, I'm just kidding. I love my children all month long. <laughs> but after ovulation is is a time when you want to do maybe more self-caring activities. You want to do more yin yoga. You want to just be more reflective, take in more sleep, take care of your, your, your diet. You know, like this, there's power in the knowledge of how your body's functioning. And because we're cyclical beings, this is a repetitive cycle that you could get information and you can predict then how, how to, you know, orient your life. How do you plan your life based on your cycle? I think that's, that's really magical stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So another question from the chat says, what do you want NDs to take away from the course? So I'll start, then you, then you compliment me. Okay. Um, so basically fertility literacy or cycle charting literacy. 
I want our students to realize that by charting the cycle with wiping observations and charting with certain um, colored stickers on the chart, you're going to get a visual roadmap to when to time a blood test, when to time an ultrasound, when to identify um, you know, your estrogen time, your estrogen peak, and when to identify your progesterone time and your progesterone peak. So you're going to get a roadmap, a visual roadmap of what your cycle and hormones are doing. And you can, of course, take blood tests, but you don't need to take a blood test because you'll know what the hormones are doing. You want to take a blood test so you can monitor what the blood level is, what the dosage is, and how to give a prognosis to your patients. I think that's big. And then Dr. Lou. So again, I go back to our, you know, naturopathic tenants, doctor as teacher, and this is truly a collaborative model, right? You are teaching your patients in real time how to know themselves more. And in the fertility world, this is huge, especially for patients going through any type of fertility treatments where they don't feel empowered. They don't feel like they are in control of their bodies. This is giving them back ownership over their bodies and to be able to be part of having them be part of the solution and own that is uh, it's, it's magical, right? You could see the shift in the patient, even if they are going through IVF, just knowing their bodies more, knowing when they can take certain supplements, when they need to self-care a little bit more, the quality of the foods that they need to take in at certain times of their cycle. This is so empowering for them. And this is what we want to share with our students and, and, and our community is how do we collaborate more with our patients to help them be in control of their own health. And uh, I'm a bit of a geek. You know, there, you know, for all the prescription medication out there that, that are given to patients in the fertility world, I talk about, we talk about drug herb interactions to either strengthen the drug or make the drug more effective. And so we're, as, as naturopathic doctors, we are experts at drug herb interactions and drug nutrient interactions, and we know how to enhance the power of their treatments. Um, and then another tenant of naturopathic medicine is minimum dose. So, you know, I don't want to give someone a thousand milligrams a day of progesterone. If we can do it on a hundred or 200 milligrams a day, I think that's better for the patient. And then we know how to enhance progesterone function in the blood. And so you, we're going to discuss how naturopathic, botanical, acupuncture, nutritional strategies can help really enhance fertility, timed in cooperation with the woman's cycle. So everything is in sync with her cycle. And we're going to keep it really simple. Take one or two of these before you're during your estrogen days, take one or two of these during your progesterone days. And these are the overarching themes that you want to address. And you start with the chart. It's your roadmap for the patient and the practitioner to time blood, ultrasound, acupuncture treatments, nutritional treatments, botanical treatments. Well said. Awesome. <laughs> I'm really, I'm really, really excited to, to join you guys for that. Um, we always ask our guests at the end of a podcast what one takeaway is they'd like to leave us with. I don't know if you want to do this collaboratively or independently, um, but what would you say would be one takeaway about what we've chatted about today? I just, I just want the world, especially women and young women particularly, to just be comfortable in their own bodies. So, you know, if the mission is to get white flow out there and for it to become a household name, and for there not to be a stigma about it. And it just elevates us as humans. That, that's, my, that's my mission. And my mission is to get every healthcare practitioner in the world to adore naturopathic doctors because we are wonderful. <laughs> and <laughs> we are part of the team. <laughs> yeah. So, and I want to save lives with progesterone. My dream is that if a woman is bleeding, and she's about to miscarry. She gets to the, o, the ER and every ER doctor and nurse knows progesterone. Because right now, when a woman is bleeding and about to lose her baby, they go, okay, HCG, do an ultrasound, wait and see. Not good enough. Not good enough. So I want her to throw in my belly. We are physicians and we're, we're meant to heal our patients. And I want 
the naturopathic message that we can heal not just our patients, but the healthcare system. So. Love it. Um, I love your passion and, uh, I love your, your, you know, I have a work hubby, like Dr. Dave and I are, are, are sidekicks and pals, and <laughs> I don't know what I would do without him. Uh, it's a hard profession. Uh, you have to have someone, you know, who, uh, know, gets the ND brain, but you can bounce ideas off and, and we always come at problems from different perspectives. Uh, and I can see that you guys have that dynamic duo too. So, uh, I know you're going to do great things and spread this message. Um, so congratulations. It's, it's really great, uh, speaking with you. And I know you're just at the start of it. Thank you. Uh, where do we find you? So if anybody's interested in our course, it's on January 22nd. It's a live webinar and there is a recording that will be accessible for a year after the recording is done. Um, tickets are still open. Our early bird rate closes in three days at the end of December and it's uh, fertilityce.com. And you can hit us up on social media at fertility.ce. Fantastic. And how do we find both of you um, as well, like uh, clinics and uh, social media pages uh, for your own, your own things? So I'm on Instagram. I'm Nora.Pope. On Facebook, I'm Dr. Nora Pope, comma, naturopathic doctor. <laughs> and I'm at Lakeside Natural awesome. Health Center. Uh, it's a clinic in Mississauga um, with my lovely team. Um, but on social media i'm at the fertility ND awesome. on instagram well thank you uh dr nora and dr jessica uh it's really a pleasure to have you here and uh jess and i've only met once but we came uh fast friends just like the two of you i guess uh we met at a hormone course and by the third day you were rubbing my back with oils because i had an <laughs> intense wow. migraine and you were just sweet and sweet and lovely and uh and uh, I too. could just see, yeah, we, we became fat, fast friends. We can, you can always see it in another soul, right? So yeah. uh, it's lovely to chat to both of you. And uh, I look forward to your course in a couple of weeks and, and uh, we'll, we'll have you on again. I know that we didn't get to Chinese medicine and lots of other aspects of fertility. So maybe we can do that another time. Love it. Thank you so much for having us on. Yeah. Thank honor. you so much. Thank you.